All right. So um, next, uh, we are going to look at uh, um, candidate NSC, candidates for NCC in the higher visual areas. So by higher visual areas after B4, what I mean is uh, mainly this uh, ventral visual uh, areas uh, or interior temporal cortex in the case of the monkeys. And also uh, in the case of the humans, uh, it is mainly about the fusiform face area and also uh, uh, parahippocampal face areas. Uh, this is a, a flattened version of the cortex again, and uh, uh, in terms of the flattened cortex, uh, these uh, inferior temporal cortex locates uh, anterior to V form, and uh, so these part corresponds to this ideas and it's consisted of addressing monkeys uh, six areas at the time of this um, uh, Christoph Scott's uh, book publication and it's more refined right now and in uh, humans um, this corresponds to V8 uh, includes part of the uh, you know posterior part of the IT around here it corresponds to V8 the color likely color uh, areas for humans so um, Let's look at a uh, uh, case study where um, the, some uh, subjects have received uh, bilateral damage to this uh, part of the areas. I just suffered brain injury after being hit by a car a few years back, and that caused him to lose the capacity to recognize everyday objects. We asked Kevin what he sees when he looks at things. I see uh, colors, shapes, um, punctuated by the faces, the faces of people which I really recognize, and they stand out much more than anything else. That's why I can't read words or read music anymore. So um, I still can imagine what it looks like in my mind's eye, but I can't imagine what it looks like, or I can't see what it looks like when I look at it. So essentially, I find things through color. In fact, the brain is both the structural and semantic processing to be able to interpret information transmitted through vision. I can sometimes pick out small components of an object and by using memory as a reference, infer what it might be. Like if something's long and silver, it could be a spoon or a fork or a knife. And usually I use my hands to touch the end of it. So I know, oh, it's a fork or it's a, it's a knife or it's a spoon. So um, memory does play an important role in that and in everything I look. I mean, I come to this, this chair, I know, it's, I know it's a chair, I don't know what type of chair it is, I know it's pink, but I was able to sit down there. But this is my house, so I know where everything is. Um, before I could read music, but now I can't read music anymore. So I deconstruct uh, music in my mind's ear, so I listen to the piece, and I try to separate the different instruments, what they're playing, so the bass part, the, the, the treble part, the melody, and then um, or any harmonies, and then I re reconstruct it back to the guitar so i don't actually i'm not listening to something a singularity is broken down i think we do that when we learn about anything when you're a child and you take something apart you deconstruct it to find out how it works and you put it back together again and then you have this intimate knowledge about how the object works and what it is um and i do that with my in my mind with things that, that they come across especially with music anyway with deconstruction that's my son my oldest son was saying of course and this is one of my youngest son. He was younger, he's a teenager now. And, uh, yeah, that, he would find that angelic place as a demon child. <laughs> That's my eldest son when he was, um, uh, he was about six weeks old, two months old. And I think that's me here. And uh, that's uh, Aiden, my youngest son, when he was uh, a baby. And do you see the details of the face? Like, do you see the eyes clearly? What is it? What is it in the image that you recognize? The whole face. And I'll tell you why you can say I can see a whole face, but I can't see a whole object. Like this thing here, I only see parts of it. Like I see this, this diagonal things here. But I can't see the whole thing. But with the face, I see the whole thing. So you say, well, how come I can't see that in its entirety? But yet I can see the face in its entirety. It's because a completely different center of the brain processes faces and processes objects. And in me, the part that processes objects, symbols has been damaged. 
but the part that processes spaces is fine. And that's how I'm able to recognize people's faces. So I recognize my colleagues at work, my family. That's much, you know, I'd much rather have the condition I have, I'm lucky, because I'd rather have that than not be able to recognize spaces. That would be awful. Not be able to see the people you love. Okay, so that was uh, um, the case report um, and the subject reports from the patient uh, Kevin, who got the uh, agnosia of the object. Agnosia means that the um, um, lack of the recognition, despite of um, uh, intact, you know, parts of the um, object. So in his case, um, he uh, he seemed to have um, um, he seemed to have an, um, quite a good understanding of the neuroscience and he talks about uh, you know the fact that you know he can recognize our faces but uh, not the uh, vast for example is because he has a different you know areas of the brain specialized for face processing and object processing and that's probably uh, likely to be the case in his case his case um, is uh, probably the uh, lesion and specifically on the object areas but not the face area so um, by the face area, uh, what I mean is this uh, area called a uh, fusiform face area. And that's uh, sort of a ventral surface. And the two, uh, it's bigger on the right side. By the way, again, uh, right and left is flipped here. Uh, usually on the right side, there is a bigger fa uh, fusiform face area in the people. And in my case, when I did the experiment by myself, um, I found the uh, right side is much bigger. And then the PPA is a parahippocampal place area. So the parahippocampus meaning that it's closer to coming to the hippocampus and it's uh, more medial, the center, com uh, um, uh, compared to the face area. And it is uh, specifically responding to the image of the face uh, houses and also landscape and the outside scene and so on. This is um, um, uh, areas that are discovered around the two, uh, 1997 or so uh, by many different kind of the, uh, neuroimaging study um, established around the, that time. But here, um, this is a, a typical fMRI experiment uh, of roughly like six to five minutes um, alternating between the fixation cross, just you know, um, you know, staring at the blank screen uh, followed by 16 seconds or something like that of uh, faces with different uh, examples of the faces. And then again, going back to the fixation, and then our uh, next one is the house, repeated for many different kinds of houses and so on, and the face, house, face, house, repeated uh, within the, in the same subject. And then, as you can see, the, um, there are some specific areas of the brain um, especially around the form area, that uh, uh, increase the activity during the face perception. And the house, uh, you know, uh, another area that uh, responds to house, many different kind of house. And then uh, typically subtraction between the two or subtraction between each of the condition to the fixation uh, you know, period gives um, a functional definition of FFA or PPA for each individual subject. So this first form um, gyrus is a term uh, for the anatomical area or parahippocampal gyrus is uh, anatomical areas, but a face area or place area is a functionally defined areas. And each person has a slightly different location within first form or parahippocampal gyrus, okay? So um, using this uh, technique called the functional localizer, uh, now people can uh, routinely uh, localize where is your FFA, where is my PPA um, in uh, six to, you know, at most, you know, 10 minutes or something. And then that area tends to reliably respond to any kind of faces and any kind of uh, places or landmarks or houses. And this is very useful because it can, uh, with this, you can isolate areas based on the functions and then uh, test uh, various hypotheses about a particular category of the stimuli, such as face or a place and so on. And we, as you will see, this has been uh, used for uh, addressing the question of the uh, consciousness and attention. All right. So, uh, so 
in the case of the, the previous patient, um, you know, Japanese patient who was uh, implanted with the face and the how, uh, you know, face area and the color area. Here, the color areas were more posterior, but the face area was more anterior. Okay, and uh, the extent of the face areas are uh, unclear uh, because we don't have the uh, electrodes uh, across you know all the entire visual cortex, but uh, the entire cortex, but now, within this you know, uh, electrode um, placement, this is the part of the face areas. And these uh, figures on the right side, uh, by the way, is based on the responsivity of each electrode. Of course, um, you know, um, tested with a face image, house image, color image, uh, and so on. And then uh, the size of the ball uh, shows the uh, strengths of the response uh, in the log of the P values. P values of 60 or uh, 15 is a very gigantic, you know, uh, uh, significance. And it's almost like, you know, uh, if you do the prediction of which categories uh, he was seeing, it's almost gives you 100% accuracy based on this, you know, there is a response. But now the uh, critical question for this is, uh, what happens if you um, stimulate these FFA areas? And here, uh, pair 181, 182. So that corresponds to uh, this area, this pair. If you stimulate, what happens? That's the question. And then, uh, you know, uh, just to remind you, 177, 178 pair here. This was a, a pair that was uh, stimulated uh, when I uh, showed the uh, video. And he was staring at the box and it says, that, oh, left side of the box looks like a rainbow. And then when he was looking at the face, he said that if I look at the face, this side will look like a rainbow and glowing on the left side because it's a right hemisphere. Okay. And uh, it's important to note that you know these electrical stimulation is controlled by the doctor, and the patients are never possible to uh, guess which part of the brain was actually stimulated. So all these, you know, uh, bandage is uh, uh, connecting to the electrodes and the, all the wires go behind his you know, back and then goes to the um, stimulation uh, computer that is uh, located in the other part of the uh, room. And then doctors who control this stimulation electrode is invisible to him. And so, you know, um, he also doesn't uh, feel anything in terms of pain or tingling sensation uh, when he uh, Receive that any micro stimulation for these areas. So, given that this is very important kind of observation, okay, because um, it's a pure double blind kind of you know um, experiment. And then when he was stimulated with the uh, uh, you know face electrode, and then when he was seeing the face of this doctor, then he said, "Oh, your face completely changed. I don't know what's going on. Your eyes change." That's a typical kind of you know description of the face area stimulation, okay? And then also, uh, when he was stimulated, uh, while he was looking at this book uh, face, then uh, it said, he says that just for the very first second, I saw an eye, an eye, and the mouth. So in this uh, case, um, this particular stimulation seems to have caused a part of the face, like, you know, impression on the um, uh, object. And then the, this paper uh, describes other types of the objects, and uh, he seems to uh, spontaneously talk about, you know, rainbow color or, or uh, the face um, upon the stimulation. And um, so this is a um, very compelling evidence that an FFA is um, uh, sufficient uh, to generate a face uh, conscious perception or a face MCC. And uh, uh, after these uh, experiments, uh, you know, uh, no, not only these, uh, okay, so not only these um, experimental uh, evidence in humans, uh, we also know that, you know, monkeys actually do also possess the uh, face processing system. And this is a um, coronal slice of the monkey in fMRI and done in 2006 or so where people started to recall the neural activity while um, or insert the electrode based on the fMRI or MRI guidance. So this uh, is a uh, done, um, experiment where 
they first did this you know, face localizer for monkeys. So a bunch of faces, a bunch of houses, a bunch of flowers, and so on. And then uh, uh, found you know, this particular patch in this uh, uh, inferior temporal cortex contain the faces. Okay? So these you know, yellow things are the box cells that responded to these you know, faces much more strongly than any, any other categories. And then you note that you know, uh, very close to this, is an auditory cortex. And then monkey's uh, brain is much, much smaller than humans. It's about the size of this, you know, our fist or so. So even though it looks like, you know, big, um, in fact, it's very, very tiny. And uh, you can imagine that, you know, uh, recording this um, area or missing just by one millimeter, you don't find any face uh, um, patches, okay? But what this uh, um, Doris Stahl's group um, did with this uh, monkey fMRI combined electrophysiology is that after localizing face patches and then target the um, electrodes into that area, then they found that 90% uh, of the visually response neurons over there are strongly face selected. So this uh, figure shows a summary of many different kind of the images, like uh, 16 faces, 16 bodies, fruit, gadgets, hands, and then scramble. And then uh, looked at the firing rate of these neurons. And uh, really surprisingly, or, um, this is across uh, uh, 180 cells, but um, almost all of them responded any kind of faces, but not other. So this um, entire patch is almost purely composed of the face responsive neurons. And by, by the way, uh, uh, one of these uh, important uh, well, findings for the face neurons in IT is that they tend to have a huge receptive field compared to the B1 or B2. So uh, as I mentioned in a couple of weeks ago, neurons in the lower visual areas tend to have a small uh, receptive field and the smallest in the retinal ganglion cells. And then uh, uh, as you go from uh, retinal ganglion cell to LGN to B1, it becomes slightly bigger. And then B2, even further bigger, and the B4, and then IT covers almost like uh, sometimes uh, almost entire visual field. And what it means is that the, when you are looking at the firing rate of these neurons, then faces that are presented in anywhere in the visual field uh, will generate the response to these neurons. And that's the sort of the idea of the receptive fields of the IT neurons. And this is very important considering whether they are uh, the neural correlates of consciousness, okay? So, and, um, and this is an uh, example uh, uh, mentioned in the Christoph Cox book, but uh, also not only the faces, um, whenever um, monkeys get uh, trained to be familiarized with some kind of you know, target object, let's say in this case, paper clip, a bended paper clip, and then uh, monkeys were trained to discriminate its orientation for several months. Then um, they found uh, some neuron that respond to this particular object of a particular view in 3D. So in this case, um, they monkeys are basically uh, understanding that you know uh, these uh, clips are different view of the same electron, a uh, same uh, paper clip, and this is different, you know, on bending and uh, this particular view generated a huge response of um, one particular IT neurons. And this type of the um, um, very selective um, pro response, complex response property with the huge receptive field is a hallmark of the IT neurons. And this is another types of the face neurons. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, Dorstal's experiment was um, uh, conducted in terms of follow-up of all these experiments. But uh, previously, people found that uh, uh, if you uh, put the electrode around there, sometimes you find the neurons that respond to exclusively to the particular phase. In this case, it is a, a phase of, I think, uh, Leopold, uh, David Leopold, which I'm gonna talk about uh, towards the uh, end of this, this week's lecture. And in particular, in this particular neuron, uh, responded more strongly to the profile of the side of view of this uh, phase. And slightly different angles, um, or in you know, opposite phase, uh, you know, angle this side versus this side, 
generates a response, but not to the um, front or back side. And it's also specific to this beard face, but not other faces. Like this one, it didn't. And this one, uh, somewhat smaller. And then these Rubin's face illusion, it doesn't, uh, didn't respond uh, much. Interestingly, monkey, uh, when they saw the face, in this face versus illusion, they produce, uh, produce much stronger response. But you know, when the uh, contour is such that you know uh, we see vast, monkey also seems to see vast, and that's corresponding to you know low firing rate. And these uh, uh, four is a low resolution image, so it's a bit difficult to see. But they, it's all in a monkey uh, faces, and that doesn't also respond uh, generate a lot of responses. So. These specific um, and uh, also, you know, rotation, uh, uh, you know, specific uh, neurons are found in IT in monkeys. And this is um, uh, one of the nature papers uh, 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 from Crystal Kosterad. And then when he, they were publishing this paper, I was there as a grad student and uh, they were quite excited about this finding. So what it, uh, this is figured showing is, um, Another types of uh, uh, experiments uh, recording the single neuron uh, response from the epilepsy patient. And uh, epilepsy patients, um, you know, you saw the video a couple of minutes ago, they are implanted with these electrodes to uh, localize the four sides of epilepsy. And we are going to talk about um, epilepsy, epilepsy loss of consciousness in the, uh, week 11 or 10. But, for those people, because this epilepsy is so you know, devastating, they need to have an, um, you know, uh, first try the drugs to uh, uh, see, uh, you know, um, uh, soothe the uh, seizure. However, in many cases, um, the currently available drugs have either side effects or not really uh, useful. So um, some of the um, uh, patients uh, resort to this um, uh, surgical uh, resection of the um, uh, seizure foresight. And to do that, uh, minimally, to minimally uh, remove this seizure foresight, they implant the electrodes and monitor where uh, the seizure originated from. And if you don't do that, then you might cut too much. And then uh, you might have heard of this uh, very unfortunate person, uh, HM, who uh, uh, was taken a lot of, you know, uh, cortical areas uh, involved in the uh, memory and then he lost uh, uh, memory uh, for his life. Um, but anyway, so this is a medial temporal lobe that uh, includes a hippocampus and also amygdala and the entorhinal cortex and so on, which is uh, typically uh, regarded as a high level recognition or um, cognition memory is the target of this epilepsy uh, recording. And here, what they found was that uh, um, so they, they looked at the neuronal firing um, a property of this uh, uh, re recording from the uh, hippocampus here, okay? And then uh, based on the previous experiment, they kind of expected that the hippocampal neuron has a um, uh, preference to the images that the uh, um, uh, patients are familiar with. So as I mentioned, you know, after um, the practice of the um, bending, you know, clip and so on, uh, monkeys tend to show some specific, you know, um, uh, response to the bending clip in his IT, and the hippocampus is receiving the input from the IT and so on. So uh, what they, uh, Kiaroga and so on, are um, did was to do this uh, screening procedure. So uh, in let's say day one or day two they would ask the patient what kind of, you know, um, uh, movie they watch or TV series and also uh, what kind of, you know, um, uh, hobby um, the patient has and so on. And then in this particular patient, um, uh, they, this person really liked uh, watching the um, TV show Friends. And also um, he or she watched, uh, she really liked the basketball and um, various different kind of you know movies, and she wanted to go to uh, you know uh, Australia, so that's a Sydney Opera House, or Paris, uh, I don't know the Pisa, and uh, many other areas. And she also uh, reported uh, watching you know uh, hating or liking spider or snakes and so on. And then 
they collected all these images uh, from the internet and then showed each image one by one to the patient. And then um, after uh, several weeks or several months of uh, you know, um, analysis, they uh, uh, found all these you know, responses. And then they also you know, uh, uh, speeded up all these procedures so that you know, uh, now uh, uh, they can do it in just like you know, 30 minutes or so during the lunchtime. And then after finding these particular neurons, that um, found um, you know um, okay so this neuron seems to be responding to let's say one particular image then let's get many different kind of uh, examples uh, that um, it would be categorized with this you know type of the image uh, during the lunchtime and then present the patient again in the you know afternoon so that's a kind of the you know really long story of this uh, behind this experiment but then what's uh, in the end what they found was that the uh, in this particular, you know, okay, one neuron that fires this uh, face photo of the Jennifer Aniston, okay, and then each of the row corresponds to each trial presentation of uh, one second of the Jennifer Aniston, okay, and the all the subject was doing is that the pressing the button if they saw the face, and then if they saw non face like this in a snake, they don't press the button or something like that, and then. Because they found that, you know, oh, this particular neuron seems to uh, respond to Jennifer Aniston, they collected lots of different versions of the Jennifer Aniston photos, okay, and then presented to him. Um, then what they found was that, oh, this neuron really responds to any kind of Jennifer Aniston. This is a, a five or six trials, and then this is an uh, average firing rate. And notice that, uh, difference of the Jennifer Aniston photo is quite substantial, you know, background or color or you know, emotion is very different. And also interestingly, this is um, still a potential anecdotal, but uh, when they um, paired with a Brad Pitt, uh, Jennifer Aniston with a Brad Pitt, uh, you may not know, but they were married at the time, then the response became very, very weak. And this may be because the neurons are not really, you know, not really predicting um, their divorce in the end, but uh, a Brad Pitt neuron, which may, you know, uh, exist nearby that neuron, may be inhibiting this Jennifer Aniston neuron, or maybe because of the attentional uh, uh, selection going on, and then uh, when they are paired with the Brad Pitt, you know, um, patient may attend to the Brad Pitt more or something like that. We don't, we don't know, but uh, what we know is that the response to the Jennifer Aniston with Brad Pitt became really low. And all other new uh, response, you know, for different, you know, different types of the, you know, female actors. Um, and uh, also, you know, uh, uh, basketball or any other stuff, you know, it didn't respond. But this was very specific. But specific in terms of category of the Jennifer Aniston, but as long as it's Jennifer Aniston, then it responded. Here's uh, another uh, example. This is a right anterior hippocampus. And then in this case, um, um, this neuron re uh, uh, responded to Halley Valley theory. And uh, this is again, you know, found within, you know, the screening session of this one particularly uh, responded to Halley Valley. Berry, so uh, they've tried to find many, many different kind of uh, images by Heli Barry. And that uh, they couldn't find many images like, you know, this, so they also presented a, a word line drawing or um, a cat woman. Okay, so this was, um, you know, a part of the Batman series and the, uh, Heli Barry uh, played in that movie as well. And also, this is the text of the Heli Barry and the other different kind of, you know, uh, the text was also tried for this particular um, uh, neuron. And then what they found was, uh, again, surprisingly, not only these images of Harry Barry, but also a drawing, and so even Catwoman uh, generated a response, and somewhat bigger response was also um, produced by the text of the Harry Barry. Okay, this is, again, a pointing to the fact that you know this neuron may be related to the conceptual understanding of the Halley Barry, but not the visual property or scene of the Halley Barry itself. But this is a kind of a response that we can find 
if you have enough a chance to record the neurons from the humans in the hippocampus. And then um, one more example. Here is the uh, uh, neurons that responded to Sydney Opera House here. But also um, this Buhari Temple. I think this is this. And uh, this is also quite interesting because this person didn't uh, anecdotally uh, differentiate these two types of the buildings, actually, you know. Uh, Bahai Temple and Sydney Opera, at least you know, uh, seen uh, for one second, um, looked the same to um, this patient. And that res uh, generated this response. But because of the difference in uh, you know, shape, maybe that's the reason why response, overall response looks a bit different. But of course, um, it doesn't uh, respond to other types of the images, maybe uh, a little bit for this one, but many of the buildings. Um, uh, famous buildings, Eiffel Tower or uh, Pisa, you know, uh, uh, Tower doesn't, uh, Tower of the Pisa doesn't uh, generate a response. So, uh, in terms of the uh, find, uh, you know, search for the MCC, what's also important uh, to do is uh, to do this type of the experiment with the, uh, uh, you know, um, MCC paradigm, right? So, one of the uh, experiments they did was um, this uh, backward masking experiment. After identifying the neuron, which responds to this uh, World Trade Center, they presented this with only very short time, uh, 33 milliseconds up to 264 milliseconds, and then uh, followed by the backward maskers. And then uh, when the subject, you know, um, uh, recognize the image that they need to say, so here the red one, corresponds to the trials, uh, subjects said, oh, I don't understand it, okay? And sometimes uh, when it's a face, for example, Mother Teresa or some, uh, somebody else, then the blue uh, trial exists. And these are the trials when subjects saw, oh, I saw the face, or I saw the Mother Teresa or something like that. And then in any case, uh, at 33 milliseconds, there was no response. But at 66 milliseconds, when subject responded uh, or saw, uh, the World Trade Center, then they show the pretty, uh, response, but not when uh, subject deny the same. And same goes for 132 or 264 milliseconds. So here the stimulus is the same in this, you know, three cases, but the conscious reports are different between blue trial versus red trial. And only blue trials of seeing World Trade Center elicited the response. Okay, so this is again consistent with the interpretation that um, uh, it is a conscious um, uh, recognition of that or concept or understanding of World Trade Center that uh, evoked this response of this particular neuron in the right entrinal cortex in this case. And this is a population response across many different neurons uh, recorded from um, the same uh, similar areas and showing that um, um, the separation of the trials based on the you know, visibility, either recognized or not recognized within each of the um, duration. So um, seems to differentiate the response, okay? Um, it's up to, uh, if it's, uh, let's say, you know, if we look at the threshold uh, trials around here, when our uh, patient recognize the image, then it's about 1.5 up to, you know, uh, firing rate. This is a normalized firing rate, but it doesn't reach up to 1.5 for the unrecognized trial, but it still, you know, increases the uh, firing rate. So this amount uh, here may be corresponding to uh, unconscious response uh, of the neurons, or it is uh, generating something, but it doesn't, uh, a result in the reports in the patient. That's one interpretation. So in summary, in this uh, part of the uh, uh, lecture, what I uh, talked was that the inferior temporal cortex and the ventral temporal cortex, uh, including the medial temporal cortex, uh, is uh, really crucial for object or face recognition. 
And the lesion of these areas uh, can uh, result in uh, object agnosia, like Kevin's case. And uh, if it's uh, in FFA, a uh, face area, then uh, prosopal agnosia can result. And fMRI activation can be used to identify FFA and PPA uh, functionally. And also uh, stimulation of these areas can uh, generate a face person. And the PPA can also, uh, is known to generate some kind of topographical person. And also the uh, targeted recording within the face patch in the monkey reveals our, uh, you know, concentration of the uh, face neurons. And uh, uh, also similar kind of uh, uh, effort can be made for human uh, medial temporal recording, global recording, and then find even more uh, finer and also uh, specific type of the responses uh, can be found in the medial temporal role. And uh, in to uh, well, one of the things that I wanted to point out is that uh, localizing the areas first, and then combine that with the stimulation or report of the phenomenology from patients. And then also, if we have an uh, opportunity to do the recording of the neural activity, this constitutes a really powerful method for the future NCC. And just um, without doing any fancy experiment, it is still you know, already you know, quite striking uh, and many things we can learn. And this is still like, you know, there are lots of things to be done in this area, but um, um, this constitutes a very promising uh, future research. So uh, wh what does it mean? Uh, so monkey IT and the human uh, medial temporal lobes neurons are very selective in terms of response property. And to the extent that, you know, it only responds to Jennifer Aniston and not uh, with uh, Brad Pitt, right? Uh, but um, you can ask yourself, do they correspond to what we report? or what we see? That's the uh, question for the consciousness, actually. Also, as I mentioned, uh, these neurons tend to have a really big uh, receptive field. So the response itself may not differ when the face is here or there or there or there. Also, I didn't uh, strongly emphasize, but the neurons in our medial temporal role is uh, very, very sparse in firing. Um, it usually uh, fires only in a couple of uh, spikes here, for example, over um, one second. So one second is, you know, from here. Uh, so in the case of the um, Jennifer Aniston, the response from here to here is one second. But these neuron spikes only once to five times. Okay? And it's really transient. And yet, the, our experience of the Jennifer Aniston stays, or at least a stretch from the time we see it, and then to understand that, oh, it is hard until the end of this presentation. So, in terms of also uh, temporal uh, duration, it's, it seems it's not that straightforward to uh, regard these type of response as the uh, neural correlates of consciousness of seeing uh, uh, Jennifer Aniston. So um, this also prompts us to think about, uh, let, uh, let us think about you know, whether the single neurons can be um, taken as any kind of you know, response uh, uh, mechanism for conscious person. And if not, which probably many people already uh, shares an intuition, maybe um, some kind of population or you know, areas of the neurons are uh, necessary to generate a conscious person. Um, but wh what exactly is it? That's the question. So to address this kind of you know, question, um, the next uh, uh, question is about you know, whether um, is there any better paradigm to specifically uh, talk about NCC search? And that's the binocular library we are going to talk next. <laughs>